Hello and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Bryant and I'll be your host for this webinar. Please make sure your microphones and web cameras are disabled during the presentation to provide for a smooth recording. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You're welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments and insights. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar is next week on October 14th, Improving Your Genealogical, Genealogical Research Skills with James Tanner, and that'll be at 5.30 p.m. If you'd like to access a previous webinar recording, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from Hannah Bell, who will be giving a presentation on going further with Scottish genealogy. Hannah Bell moved to Scotland from Canada seven years ago and lived in Wales first before moving up to Scotland. She has been working at the Scottish Borders Archive as their genealogy registrar for the last five years. She also works for Archaeology Scotland under their Stobbs Camps Stobbs Camp project as digital archivist. And Hannah actually pre-recorded her webinar, but she's going to be able to um, join us later for the Q&A session. Hello, my name is Hannah Bell and I work at the Scottish Borders Archives. And I have my own company, which is called Border Memories. I'm going to be talking to you about Scottish genealogy and how you can go further with the records. I'll start by giving you a brief introduction into the differences between Scottish records and what can be found on Scottish records. And then I'll move on to explain why it's important for you to connect with the archive that is in the area where your ancestors might have lived. To start off with, I would recommend that you go back and listening to Beginning Scottish Research by James Tanner. It gives you an introduction to the history of Scotland and will show you how your ancestors might fit into that picture. The other course I would highly recommend is a free course offered by the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. It can be accessed through a website called Future Learn, and it's called Genealogy Researching Your Family Tree. They do an excellent job of explaining how you can get started and highlight some of the sources that I'll mention, but they also give you a brief introduction into other records that might also help you. Uh, it's a six week course and it is definitely worth the time working through it and completing it. So where do you start? Uh, first of all, talk to relatives, ask them what they remember, see what names they remember, what stories they might have heard. It's always worth recording this as well uh, for yourselves for future reference. And any stories you hear, it's always worth taking them with a grain of salt as well. I've been quite lucky in that my family has always had an interest in where they came from. Several of my great aunts and uncles wrote histories of their family and their parents and grandparents. My great great grandparents also wrote a little bit of information they went around and interviewed some of the settlers that were in the area where they were so i've been quite lucky that a lot of people have i've got a lot of stories about my own family and where they came from and, and what they were like so it's always worth going and talking to your relatives and seeing what you can find out from them seeing whether there are perhaps family bibles that will list names and dates or any other records like that when you're doing this always 
look at it with a grain of salt though. Um, my great grandmother was adamant that her father was a fleeing French bureaucrat and he had fled from France and come over to Britain when in reality going back as far as I could they were all born in Buckinghamshire in a place called Newport Pagnell and Little Wilston and there was no evidence of any records linking to them to France. Um, now, perhaps if I went back another 400 years, there might have been, um, but I've not found anything yet. So it's worth always bearing in mind that sometimes people like to make themselves seem a lot more important than they were. Um, and it's worth just, just bearing that in mind when you're talking to them. Um, because they may have may have false memories or they may have been told inaccurate things as well. As far as records are concerned, there are birth, marriages and deaths, which are all statutory records, which I'll talk a little bit about. Uh, there's baptismal records, census and valuation rules, wills and testaments. Wills are quite helpful in that they list families as well. And it will give you the relationships between the various members of the family. So they're all quite useful records to look into. So one important date to remember for Scotland is 1855. Um, after 1855, statutory registration began. And these statutory records were taken very seriously and there was a high level of accuracy when they started. Uh, there was a district examiner appointed in 1856 to make sure that the registrars were all entering consistent information. Uh, we now have three district examiners which do the same job to make sure that all registrars are filling in the birth certificates and death certificates and marriage certificates as they should be. Um, they are there to catch small inaccuracies and small discrepancies. So from 1855, we generally say that if you can't find someone after 1855, that there has been a transcription error or there's been another error in that sense, or they moved somewhere else because it's very, very unlikely that you won't be able to find them after 1855. These records include births, marriages, and deaths. Um, they also include divorce records. Divorce records did start for later on and they were separated a bit later on. Um, some of the earlier divorce records are actually attached to the marriage records. What you'll often find is a divorce, the year that a divorce happened, um, one of the couple got remarried within a couple of years and that's the reason that they got the divorce and finalized it. Um, early on, there weren't as, we don't know as much about divorce, but early records, there's, there's not as much recorded when it came to divorce. Uh, I'm sure there were couples that separated, but it's not the kind of thing that you would find in, in records like these. So this is a Dashi birth record. Um, for Scotland. This is for Thomas Bell and it gives you when he was born and where he was born. It also gives you the parents names. The two pieces of information that make it a little bit unique are it tells you where the parents were married. So they were married on the 10th of February 1906 in Hoyk and it also gives the maiden surname of the mother. If they weren't sure on the maiden surname, they will just put a line that it would and put it as blank um, if they didn't know. And it's fairly standard. It gives you the occupation of the father and who registered the death. Uh, in some cases, you'll see it's signed with an X and that's generally when there was some element of illiteracy. In 1855, there was an irregularity in births for that year and that year only. 
they recorded a lot more information on the birth certificates. They mentioned previous children. As you can see, it says her eighth child. Um, it says it tells you that she was 34 years old. It gives you statistics. They had three boys and three girls, and the two boys were deceased. So it does give you a lot of information on the 1855 births. It can be true for some of the other records as well. 1855 seems to be just a irregular year. After that, they included less information. You won't find the mentioning the number of children that a woman had. It tends not to mention her age or her husband's age. Uh, but it still does give you a lot of details that are important, such as her maiden surname and where they were married. So this is a marriage certificate. Um, again, it's fairly standard. It gives you a place that they were married. It gives you their names, their parents' names. Other little things it does are it on these ones, it lists the maiden surname of the mothers. It gives you the occupation of the bride. Uh, it also mentions whether the parents are deceased or not. So three of the parents were deceased before 1908 and one is still living. So that helps you narrow down the date that you're looking for when it's the date of death. Uh, it also gives you witnesses. Uh, in some cases, it'll give you the addresses of the witnesses as well. It's always worth noting witnesses, and I'll tell you why a little bit later on. So these are death certificates. Um, they are fairly standard, naming the person who they're married to. Uh, later ones give you a date of birth. Earlier ones give you an age at death. They list the parents, whether the parents were deceased, what the occupation is for the for the fathers. Uh, if the child was illegitimate, it'll give you the occupation of the mother. It will also tell you if they were known by another name at some point. Um, on some certificates, it will say something along the lines of Thomas Bell, previously known as Thomas Graham's Law. So. It does link records in that way. The other thing it does, so in 1860, you can see here, Euphemia Scott or Riddle. If you look at her mother, her mother was Mary Riddle, maiden surname Scott. So chances are Euphemia was born illegitimately to Mary Scott. And after she was born, she got married to someone called Riddle. So there's little clues like that that you can find on the certificates if you're looking. Um, with the witnesses on the death certificate, always look and see what the relationship is. Because in some cases, if it was a distant relative, they might do something like get the mother's maiden surname wrong or get the date of birth slightly wrong. Uh, it all depends on, on who was registering it. So it's, it's worth seeing who was the informant. So before 1855, there were the parish registers. These were kept by the Church of Scotland. And they are less standardized. It costs money for people to get their children baptized, for them to get married and to be buried as well. So in some cases, if a family was particularly poor, um, they wouldn't have bothered. Birth certificates are not as important as they are today. They weren't at that time. So whether someone had a birth certificate or not didn't really matter. Um, so we have parish registers, they're baptisms, not births. Um, baptisms would always take place after a birth. In some places, there's proclamation of bans. So when you see a couple getting married in two different parishes, it's because it was a proclamation of bans and they would have to proclaim 
in both the parish of the husband and the wife. Um, if it is just a proclamation of bans, there is a chance as well that the marriage never actually took place. With the death records, it's mort cloth records that tend to be recorded. Uh, a mort cloth was a piece of cloth. Um, it could be embroidered quite lavishly, depending on the status of the person that the church had. And it was used to cover the body of the deceased when it was getting buried, I believe. Um, in some cases, certain groups had more cloths. So there's a, we have a book, which was the more cloth records for the tailors guild. It was the five guilds in the area, um, weaving tailors and anyone who was a member of that guild used to be able to rent the cloth off the guild and use it for burials. In some cases with more cloth records, they, the person who's listed is not the person who has died, it's the person who has rented the cloth for the person who's died. So that's another, another thing to watch out for. So these are baptism records. One is from 1707 and one is from 1749. They are both in Greenlaw. The one in 1707, you can see it just says, baptized Jean Redpath, daughter, lawful to George Redpath. So it gives you her name and that she was a lawful child of George Redpath, who was her father. So it's not very much information to go on. There's a date and, and that's about it. Uh, later on in 1749, we find another record, which is for Isabel Shaw, lawful daughter of Robert Shaw, weaver. It tells you where he was from, it tells you who his wife was, and it gives you the names of witnesses. So it gives you a bit more information. In other cases for marriages, this is all you'll get. It just gives you the names and that they booked and the price that they paid and the date for it. So you can't do very much with that. Um, it almost halts you in your tracks because you can't go much further with it. There are ways around it though. Um, if you just keep looking through some of the parish registers and the Kirk session minutes, you can sometimes find a bit more information about them. This is another marriage record. This gives you more information. It tells you Patrick Johnson was from Nenthorne. He married a Miss Mary Otter, who was from the parish of Matlock. So you'd expect to find a proclamation of bans in Matlock as well, which might give you a bit more information. So they've given up their names for proclamation of bans. But this is a natural marriage certificate. This is a proclamation of bans. So again, there is a possibility that this marriage never actually took place. With death records, uh, some of them give a bit more information. Others appear like this. So you have A. Lang's wife, Rochester, and you have Alexander Lang. It gives you the cost of both of their burials, and it gives you the date. There is a way around this um, in some cases, which is using the monumental inscriptions. I'll, I'll give you the example of that because you can generally find those in your local archives. So I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Right, it's always important to pay attention to the witnesses. This, I was looking for a Patrick Johnson who was at Hutton Hall Mill. And as you can see, he's a witness on this particular record. It is for James Johnson, who is son of a Patrick Johnson, who was a tenant in West Newton. When you are dealing with a lot of parish records and trying to trace families down, these bits of information can 
give you clues as to what's happening. So just from this record, I know there's two Patrick Johnsons in the same sort of area having children about the same time. Because um, I found births for Patrick Johnson in the same years. So it makes it clear that there was not just one Patrick Johnson. So that's just one way in which witnesses can help. Another record, so this is two of Patrick's children. Patrick Johnson had a tenant who was a tenant in Hutton Hole Mill, had a son called Wynn. Uh, then a little bit later on, we find him having a son called George, and we find a Wynn Johnson of Hilton registering, uh, witnessing the birth. So again, chances are there was some sort of relationship between Wynn Johnson of Hilton and Patrick. Johnson of Hutton Hall Mill, but there will there's not proof um, unless we can find birth, parish baptisms for both of them. We can't prove that they were connected, but this is fairly strong evidence that there was some sort of a relationship, whether they were cousins, brothers, whatever it was, and chances are. If we keep digging into it, we might be able to find a little bit more information that sort of separates them out or shows us how they're connected. So in many cases, um, you kind of, you get back to a certain point and you hit a brick wall and you can't get any further no matter how hard you try. Once you hit this point, it's worth trying to go forwards with siblings. Like we said, the important date is 1855. So it's worth trying to see if any of the siblings were died after 1855 or were born after 1855 or one on, on registers after 1855 because in with parish registers with birth records as you saw with the previous one it just gave a father's name so if we can find siblings for her and one of her siblings we can find her dying after 1855 then we can get a mother's name and a mother's maiden name then we can go back and look for a marriage between them so when you get to this point, it is a bit more chopping and changing a little bit. In one case, I was talking about Patrick Johnson before. For him, what I had to do was I had to map out all of the Johnsons in Whitsum and Hilton and Hutton. So I looked for all the parish records I could, all the monumental inscriptions I could, anything I could get my hands on to establish the families that were there and were having children. So in that case, I was able to establish about four families that linked back to two people, which I think there was some relation there, um, but I wasn't able to prove it, unfortunately, because I didn't have any records that matched up. But I was able to using the monuments inscriptions, I was able to establish a lot of the relationships with the parish registers, the marriages and the deaths. So in some cases, it is a case of putting in a lot of time and mapping all the families down. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing that in larger parishes because it'll just take you too much time. I also would offer a word of caution if it is a surname that's quite popular or quite common like Scott or Turnbull or in this case Bell was quite common in Dumfriesshire so it would just be impossible to confirm which ones were connected and which ones weren't just because there would be too many of them So where'd you kind of go from here? You've done a bit of forwards and backwards. You've 
checked the statutory registers, the parish registers, you've talked to relatives, you've found the census records, and you've got as much as possible out of those records as you can. Um, so the next step after you've kind of established all that information is to check out the local and national archives of the area where your ancestor was living. In our case, in this area, it would be the Heritage Hub, which is the Scottish Borders Archives. There is the contact information for the Heritage Hub. At the minute, under the current situation, it's only open a Monday, Wednesday, and a Friday. I'll put this slide up for a bit longer at the end, but that one's for this local area. There's one for Dumfrieshire, Perth, there's the national records that are up in Edinburgh. So it's worth trying to find what record office or archives is, covers the area where your ancestor was. One thing that archives tend to hold is irregular records. Uh, this tends to be the national archive rather than the local archives. They're not all found on Scotland's people. Um, the Catholic records and a few of the other churches are found on Scotland's people, but most of the records on there tend to be from the Church of Scotland. There were several denominations in Scotland and churches split and rejoined different churches. Uh, people wouldn't like a minister and they'd go off and start a new church with a different minister and then something else would happen and they might go back to their previous church and there's all sorts of events like that. Um, there were also marriage houses where couples could get married. Uh, the one, there's one in Coldstream, Coldstream Bridge, and there's also Lambert and Toll. These are both to the borders. There are others in other areas of Scotland. So it's always worth checking what church records or other churches existed in a particular area at a certain time um, when you're looking for your ancestors. Because even if they came over and they are listed as Presbyterian, they might have been part of one of the churches that split away and rejoined. Um, so it's always worth, worth checking that as well. In some cases, though, these church records from other churches didn't survive. Uh, in other cases, the records that they kept were a lot better than the ones that were kept by the Church of Scotland. So these are two marriage houses that are in the borders, um, Lambert Toll Marriage House and Coldstream Bridge Marriage House. It, it, they're pretty self-explanatory. They were houses where people could get married if they so wished. Um, other than these, people tended to get married in the church. If you did get married in these marriage houses, then it wouldn't go into the uh, Church of Scotland records. Uh, here's a couple of other church records. These are both for baptisms. Um, so the one on the top left, that is for the Catholic Church in Hoyk. Um, it gives you a name, whether the child was lawful or illegitimate, and the parents' names. Then the one at the bottom is for the East Bank Secession Church. And it gives you a bit more information. It gives you the parents' names, the occupation, the where they were, what parish they were from, the mother's name, and some witnesses. So it gives you that one gives you a bit more information. So again, it's dependent on the church and it depends on what the minister thought was important or what the church thought was important to record. In the archives, you'll find some early marriage records as well. Um, 
this is a record from 1720, which is a marriage certificate. So it gives you the names of the bride and groom, and it gives you the witnesses' names, and it tells you a little bit about them, like uh, what parish they were from. And I think it tells you his occupation as well. And then on the right is a marriage contract. These tended to be for people who are a bit more well off. Uh, and it will give you a lot more detail on property that was held, parents' names. And it, it is what it says it is. It's a contract. Um, and it gives you witnesses at the bottom as well. There's also population lists that you can find in archives. So these kind of vary depending on what the person was trying to record. The militia list, it's only men between a certain age. It gives you an occupation in some cases and it gives you a place as to where they were from. This particular list is from 1806 and it's from Gala Shields. And the militia list tended to be around that time period. Um, there's also the hearth tax list from Channel Kirk, which is 1691 to 1695, and it gives you the name of the person and uh, the cost for the number of hearths that they had. Uh, there are also some population lists and lists kept by the church. This is a communion list. Uh, and it lists everyone who was eligible to take communion on a particular day. It tells you where the people were from and it lists women as well. Um, so you can see here, it says Robert Allen, who was in Paxton, Isabella Allen, the wife. So that would be, she'd be the wife of Robert Allen. There's also, in the case of Darnet population list from 1801, it lists the names of the people. It gives you the number of people that were in the household, how many women, how many men, and various other details that they must have thought were important at the time. Um, it gives you a little bit of an indication of how big the families were. So the church kept a few records like this as well. They also kept, in some cases, they were what's known as ministers visiting lists. So he would record the names of everyone he visited on one of his rounds around the parish. Now, I previously told you, I showed you the death records, um, the mort cloth records in the parish registers. This is the monumental inscription that matches those two records. And as you can see, it gives you a lot more information. Uh, it tells you, it was Alexander Lang. It tells you where he was from. He was in Cowrig when he died, how old he was, gives you his wife's name, her maiden name. It gives you the name of a daughter and her age. It tells you about a son and his son's wife. So using this information, you can go, you can look up 1879. That's obviously after statutory registration began. So it'll give you quite a lot of detail. Whereas if you look up Jean Lang, you might not be able to find as much information because she died in 1851. So the monumental inscriptions are great and these are usually found at the archives as well. They're generally put together by the family history societies. And the older ones are really good as well um, because in some cases, headstones have tipped over now and you can't read them anymore. So it's a, it's a great source to, to use to match up parish records. So these are some other records that are held in the archives. Uh, there was the Dunn Soup Kitchen and it lists everyone who's present for a committee meeting of sorts. There's the Poor Law, which gives you a little bit of detail about the person and they were claiming on the parish for support and you can see they were in and out a bit uh, depending on the time of the year. There's photographs of events 
um, whether it's uh, openings of factories or get-togethers. We have picnic photographs that the local mills used to put on. There are sketchbooks kept by local artists. In some cases, they uh, this one, he sketched all the churches in a particular area, but this is the monument in memory of Jim Clark, a famous racer. And it, it show he just sketched it and it gives you the details quite clearly on there. We've got gravestone drawings um, that were part of one of our collections, our Sutherland collection. And he used to sketch out all his headstones before he um, would create them. And some of them are now tipped over and you can't read them anymore and things like that. So that gives us a bit more information as well. Uh, other records that we hold, we have newspapers, which can be very helpful, particularly uh, if someone passed away. Um, you can gather quite a lot of information from an obituary in the newspaper. But again, they tended to be later records. We have directories. Um, so this one tells you the names of the person, what their occupations were and where they lived. There are also lots of school records. These are logbooks from St. Boswell's and they tell you a little bit about how the school operated. In some cases, they will mention pupils by name. Another great resource that we have is our maps. Um, these maps can be accessed on National Library of Scotland maps. Others we hold, but this particular one, that's online um, through the National Library of Scotland maps website. And you can see it mentions um, different businesses that were in the area. In some cases, they also list the names of people who owned certain areas and certain parts of town as well, or certain, lived in certain houses. So it's interesting just having a look at them. It'll give you a bit more of an idea of the area where your ancestors were living. Another resource that is online is the Scotland's Places, and they have digitized all of the map books for the 1858 Ordnance Survey maps and they give you descriptions of a particular place. In some cases they will list who is the tenant and the owner. So it's quite interesting having a play on that and seeing what you can find there. This is only a drop in the ocean of the material that we do hold. Um, we hold 245 cubic meters of material, a standard car garage is seven cubic meters. Um, we entered our 1,262nd collection in September. Our earliest record is a music manuscript from the 12th century, and our latest record is a border events magazine from 2020. So we cover a lot of information and we hold a lot of information. Other archives will be the same. Um, so if you know about your ancestor and know rough details about your ancestor, like where they were from, what they did. It's always worth getting in touch with the local archive and seeing what records they might hold that would relate to that. Uh, we have some mill records because mills were big in our area, for example. Um, and in, in a lot of cases, we'll be able to point you sort of in, in a direction, um, even if we're not necessarily able to help you with the information that we hold. So again, this is just the contact information for the Heritage Hub, and I'll just leave that up for a little bit. And this is just my information. Um, as I said, I, I run a company called Border Memories. Um, but there's the website there, um, email, you can find me on Twitter and Facebook. 
I'm in the process of starting a blog on my website, which will highlight various records that you can use for family history and various records that are held in the archives in my area. If you want to find out when that's up and running or find out a bit more about it, if you just follow me on Twitter and I'll post up uh, when I've started um, putting that, that together. Um, if you are stuck and you are against a brick wall, um, I'm more than happy if you want to send me an email and I will see whether I can advise you on where to look or what your next step should be. Um, I just, I, I like helping people find out more about their own family history. Uh, I think it's really interesting. So just send me a message and I'll see what I can do. Um, so thank you very much and I'll answer any of your questions shortly. Okay, and if anyone from the audience has any questions, um, please post them in the chat box and Hannah, Hannah, who should be here, can answer them for us. And I will just read them to you, Hannah. So the first one is from Colby. It says, what is a sample census? I'm a bit stumped by this question. I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by a, a sample census. Uh, the census were taken every 10 years between 1841. Um, we can access until 1911. There were some records that were taken by the church, which would list particular individuals in the church. And if they were trying to get statistics for the parish uh, in relation to poor law or, or things like that, they would sometimes take a, a census of the area. Awesome. Um, and we have another question. It says, when did monumental records begin? This varies from churchyard to churchyard. It is monumental inscriptions are literally a transcription of what appears on the headstones. In most cases, they kind of start late 1700s onwards. And Again, it varies in how much detail they actually give. Um, quite often families would be buried in the same sort of area and they will all be listed on the, on the headstone. But, um, it, best is probably to get in touch with the particular area that you're interested in with the archives there. because they, They'll hold that information. Awesome. Okay, and Gerard asks, were there records kept from the marriage houses that survived? If so, where are they located? Yes, there are. A lot of them have been transcribed, and those transcriptions are held by local record offices. The original records tend to be held by the National Archives, rather than local archives all right perfect and colby asked if we could go back to the heritage hub slide so i'll, I'll go back to that really quick awesome and debbie asks are the archives part of the government or private they're part of the government a majority of them are it's under the access to information act so we hold a lot of council records and planning records. And in order to give the public free access to that information, most councils will have some sort of an archive. There are smaller archives that are private, but these tend to focus on individuals or particular houses. So there is a private archive which is held by the Duke of Bleu in this area, which is of his family papers. But then there's some records relating to his land, which is up at the National Archives. And then there's also information with us. So it varies a little bit depending on what you're looking at, but most of them are involved with the government and run by the government in some way. 
on a local level. Okay. Awesome. And uh, Debbie also asks in relation to that question, are, are they fee, are they fee based? And is there a list of Shire archives? Most archives are free to access. If you go in person yourself, they will charge a research fee if they archivists have to do it. The best place to look for archives and whether they exist is a site called Archon and it's maintained by the National Records in London and it, it lists local record offices. But I'd search for that. If you search Archon at A-R-C-O-H-O-N, it should come up. Perfect. And um, Brent asks, is there any way to get records of, of ARLs for coal miners? I don't know if that's a typo. Um, yeah, is there any way to get records of ARLs for coal, miner, coal miners? I'm not actually sure what that is. Okay. Uh, Brent, as far as uh, Brent, coal miners, if, sorry. Sorry, if you could just try to rephrase your question, then that would be great. For coal miners, there are some records that are kept. And again, they sit with the, the local archives. There are some mines which also have been made into museums and they have their own records because, because of the type of because with coal miners, a lot of that information was passed from individual to individual. There's not as many, there's not as many records relating to them. Sorry. Awesome. And Brent, just to clarify, he says it's not a typo. Uh, miners are old or contracted their kids to coal mines. It would probably say that on the census, depending on what year it was. If it's before sort of 1841, I don't think many of them would survive because they might, they'd be, individual contracts don't tend to survive as well. But it's worth, it's worth checking the census. Awesome. And it looks like the last question is from Daryl. It is in re it's in reference to um, the fee we were talking about earlier. He says, what is the fee for using the um, government archives, I believe? The fee, it depends on different archives. Um, it's not standardized across them. Generally for copies of material, it's sort of 80 pence a page and it'll be sort of a five pound processing fee. But then if it's a remote research, it can be anywhere from sort of 15 pounds to 30 pounds per hour. But okay. that includes all of the, um, all of copies of the material that they find. So they'll give you an actual report and, and list details on what they've checked and what they've not checked. Great. And we have a couple more questions from Carol. It says, what was Heritage Hub and when did it cover? So the Heritage Hub is the Scottish Borders Archives. And it's only been in the building it's in now since 2008. But it holds, like I said, the earliest record it holds is from the 12th century. And it covers, it covers all of the Scottish borders. So the four historic border counties of Selkirkshire, Roxburghshire, Berkshire, and Peeblesshire. Great, and Carol also asked, when did the census begin? The first complete census is 1841. And that's for, that covered all of Scotland and every household. 
the thing to remember with the census as well is that if they were visiting another person, they would have been recorded as a member of that household. So if you can't find someone in a particular area, they could have been visiting family. Um, we found families that were down in London visiting relatives and we couldn't find them in Scotland. So that can happen as well because it's everyone that was in a particular household on the night that the census was taken. Awesome. And Debbie asks, best, what is the best place to find digital photographs? I'd probably just do a, a Google search, search online. Um, it depends what you're looking, photographs you're looking for. Scran is another good one. Um, it's a website that has a lot of sort of local photographs. Uh, History Pin has quite a few as well. Awesome. And that looks like it is all the questions. So thanks for joining us, Hannah, and thanks for uh, presenting today. Great. Thanks very much. Of course. And let me just share my screen one more time. Just a reminder about our webinar coming up next week on the 14th, Improving Your Genealogical Research Skills with James Tanner. So hopefully you can, we hope you can all join us for that. Um, that'll be at 5.30 p.m. next Wednesday. Um, and we're, we're glad that you could all join us today. And we hope to see you next time. Have a great day.